Okay, we're going to uh, continue our program. We are very fortunate to have with us today, Dr. Barry Schifrin. Dr. Schifrin is an obstetrician and has traveled from Los Angeles to be with us here today. So thank you for that, Dr. Schifrin. I met Dr. Schifrin about 30 years ago when I retained him as an expert in my first birth trauma case. And he came to Toronto, we met for brunch to chat about the case. And I'm sure he was struck by my complete ignorance of the medicine when, when we met. Um, I realized quite quickly that if I wanted to do this kind of work, I would need a lot of years to learn the science. And over the last three decades, Dr. Schifrin has been instrumental in teaching me all I know about obstetrics to effectively represent my clients, which is about 0.1% of what he knows. I've dealt with hundreds of highly qualified experts over the years, but none have come close to matching the skill, competence, and sheer wisdom that Dr. Schifrin brings. While many defense attorneys in the United States, and I call them attorneys as they call themselves, might take exception, I've always found Dr. Schifrin to be objective, impartial, and honest. At the same time, he is a fierce advocate for any opinion he might formulate, which is essential for every expert witness. More important, Dr. Schifrin remains a true advocate for the health and well being of the fetus and neonate through his continued research and publications. One of the most important lessons I learned from Dr. Schifrin is not to blindly accept what is being published, even in reputable medical journals. If we are to be true advocates for our clients in medical malpractice cases, it is vital that we approach medical literature with at least a critical eye, if not complete skepticism. As Dr. Schifrin has told me many times, in some, obstet some obstetrical literature, it seems that doctors hate medical malpractice litigation more than they hate bad outcomes. Dr. Schifrin is here to talk about this unfortunate phenomenon, and he will talk to us about junk science. Dr. Schifrin. Thank you, Richard. Uh, I didn't really recognize myself from the introduction. Um, as uh, Richard pointed out, I'm, a, uh, I'm an old obstetrician. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm the oldest person. Uh, I woke up this morning and realized that I was the oldest person I knew intimately. Uh, it was quite a revelation. Uh, I've been asked to talk about that topic. Uh, it's a broad topic. Actually, it has gotten some currents. I understand Miriam Webster uh, just came out with the understanding uh, that gaslighting, which has some relationship to what I'm going to talk about, uh, is the most what most popular word around these days. We're trending. Uh, these days. Um, I'm not going to deal with the whole subject. It's too large. Uh, I am going to take a piece out of it, uh, hopefully uh, pertinent, related to uh, the subject uh, matter at hand, which is uh, uh, litigation, especially obstetrical litigation. A and I want to leave you, hopefully, at the end with uh, some tidbits that perhaps you will find. It uh, can we raise this? But I'll. There we go. That better. Um, the microphone doesn't fit. I mean, it's in my mouth. <laughs> I have a big mouth, but not that. You know. Is that better? We can yeah. talk a bit closer. Um, I'll leave you with some facts that. Um, uh, are a little entertaining, and uh, notwithstanding the fact that uh, you are not obstetrical personnel for the most part or necessary caregivers, uh, but I submit that you will be in a situation, an obstetrical situation, whether as the person giving birth, whether as the person uh, to whom the baby is very important, an uncle, an aunt, a niece, a daughter, uh, that you have a role irrespective, irrespective of your title and your reason for being here, 
you will have a role to play in that setting. And that is what I hope I can leave you with, irrespective of the fact that uh, you are not specifically obstetrical care providers, nor might you be in the courtroom uh, trying to uh, make the care better, uh, because all of you being here uh, do matter and you have a role to play. Oops. The definition of uh, the definition of junk science is uh, is a simple one. It is uh, science or uh, something advocated or presented as science that is purportedly a true, uh, and it, it normally uh, is used to take advantage of, of by special special interests. Uh, and that special interest not only may be defense attorneys or plaintiff attorneys or defendants or doctors trying to provide care, that we are not immune as physicians on the line to junk science. Because it, as it turns out, some of the objectives of science are not really to make care better but to make some of the things we do defensible. And you need to be careful about junk science has other definitions and other synonyms, among which is dogma, which bears a striking relationship to the definition of junk science. And that's the acceptance of things or the acceptance is quote truth, unquote, that may not in fact be true at all. And it works both ways and it works on both sides. And we talk about dogma and dogmatic, and you know you're in a problem when uh, dogmatism becomes the reigning, uh, the reigning um, basis for some opinion or some action. I shall try to make a distinction, considering the fact that we're dealing with words, I shall try to make some distinction between the words certainty, okay, between certainty and security. I should like to submit that the best combination is secure and uncertain, and the worst combination is certainty and insecurity. We are faced, as I said, tried to suggest, we are faced with all manner of junk science. Uh, one of the great purveyors is our former president, uh, who uh, uh, I may share with you when he came out with the notion that oral bleach might do something for COVID. Uh, a little known statistic is that there was a sudden peak in the poison calls to poison control in the United States. Just that pronouncement, uh, somewhat uh, junky. And there are many other such examples. I'm not going to uh, deal with them, but I am going to deal with its relationship, the relationship of junk science to fetal monitoring and a part thereof called fetal head compression. I will not deal with um, uh, something known as the shaken baby syndrome, or uh, now it's known as AHT, uh, uh, abusive head trauma. And the reason I am put it up there is not so much to talk about it, but to remind you of the obstetrical fact that not all outcomes of obstetrical care are immediately understandable at the time of birth. You cannot end. The consequences of obstetrical care do not end with an APGAR score or the behavior of the baby as a newborn. That we've come to understand that the implications, that the implications of obstetrical care go far beyond 
the labor and delivery suite. And for this notion, this, this notion of harm from shaken baby or AHT must requires in the evaluation of that case, the obstetrical care that was provided to this baby many months before. And I'll come back to that more specifically in a moment. About 50 years ago or so, this gadget was foisted on the obstetrical population. Uh, I unfortunately have to confess some role in that. I was one of the people involved with its creation and uh, uh, some of the rain that's occurred uh, as a result. Uh, this gadget is ubiquitous. It is used in virtually every uh, pregnancy during labor and delivery. And despite its ubiquity, despite its ubiquity, it is 50 years later, the subject of extraordinary uh, debate, ridicule, uh, condescension, what have you. And it, that certainly plays out not only in the courtroom and in allegations of medical negligence, it is del deliberated on a daily basis in labor and delivery suites throughout this country and throughout the world. It was foisted on the uh, obstetrical population with the understanding okay, with the understanding that it was this detector of fetal hypoxia, of oxygen deficiency in the uh, in the baby. The I'll tell you the deal with the mechanism of that in a little while. And it was this device that was going to prevent babies from being seriously uh, hypoxic, seriously asphyxiated, and it would allow us to rescue the baby from its asphyxia uh, in, in a timely way. That notion cannot possibly work. The detection is all right, but waiting until there is X amount of asphyxia before you intervene is not an approach. You have to dedicate yourself to keeping the baby out of harm's way in the first place. It has some unquestionable benefits that everybody will agree with. Everybody will agree that there are fewer stillbirths in labor, uh, fewer stillbirths in labor for the availability of the fetal monitor. People will also agree that there are reduced amount of seizures in the newborn baby. That is about all we will agree on from a positive standpoint. I believe that notion is junk science uh, without getting into the debate of how well it does work and what it do can do, but it has to be done with notions that are different from those notions with which it was introduced. One of the problems is that uh, people don't uh, read it consistently and the lack of consistent reading gives widely divergent results and that is a failure in part of the classification of heart rate patterns which were as i will try to suggest done more to protect the obstetrician than to protect the fetus what is also clinically understood is that there appears to be no benefit in terms of long-term outcome, no benefit in terms of the amount of cerebral palsy or epilepsy related to the fetal monitor. But what it clearly does or seems to be related to is the risk of cesarean section and operative vaginal delivery, uh, which is not a good thing. And now we come to some of the uh, arguments outside the medical profession. The arguments outside, and I'll do both, but the arguments outside of the medical profession, especially from the lawyers, is it's a litigant. 
a litigant is it makes lawsuits. It grieves us to say this, but fetal monitor causes lawsuits. We wouldn't have half as many lawsuits if we didn't have fetal monitoring. We didn't, wouldn't know what the hell the fetus was doing, but we wouldn't have lawsuits. A uh, Margaret Lent from Stanford uh, uh, said that not only is it of no medical benefit, it is of no legal benefit. The technique has to be abandoned. Uh, there's a Thomas Sartwell, who's a defense attorney from, from Texas, who believes not only is it should not be used, but it, that it represent that it's fundamental, uh, worst, an ethical failure not only of physicians, but of their organizations as well. Uh, getting on the uh, litigation bandwagon, even physicians, okay, have argued that it's not useful, uh, that, uh, that it causes more, quote, this is a quote, causes more harm than good. And uh, uh, one of the more uh, prominent obstetrician said reading these tracings, the damn squiggles, is like reading uh, tea leaves. Um, the fact is, um, this is a, an article by 18 of some of the widely, most widely read people in the specialty. I refer to them as the uh, 12 jurors and six alternates. Uh, but uh, that's not everybody's opinion. And, and what they said, unfortunately, the body, uh, EFM research, uh, we know less about this. Uh, we do less about this uh, uh, subject. Uh, why is it in yellow? Uh, we seem to know less about this subject uh, than we did uh, when we first introduced uh, the subject. And then they created this enormous scheme based on this classification, uh, did this very nice study, showed it didn't work, and said fetal monitoring doesn't work. Uh, and uh, part of the problem uh, with the fetal monitor is what is it you are looking for? And what we're looking for is a reduction in a cerebral palsy. And we're going to do this through the medium of using the fetal monitor to detect acid base asphyxia, which is reflected in the severity of the acidosis or the accumulation of acid in the baby. And that's how we're going to prevent uh, both acidosis and the consequences, meaning CP. The problem is there's no strong relationship between the pH or the amount of acid and either CP or immediate outcome. Is that clear? The use of the fetal monitor was predicated on the search for acidosis, this measure of asphyxia. The prevention of that asphyxia was going to prevent cerebral palsy. It was going to prevent immediately bad, immediate bad outcomes. And we were going to prevent this by rescuing the baby when there was sufficient acidosis for us to intervene. So before there was harm, we'll, te we'll tolerate as much asphyxia as we had to before there were harm. And we would rescue the baby in time. We would rescue the baby in time. And so if you start looking at these kinds of statistics, in a meaningful way, you find that low pH is a better predictor of death. It's not a predictor of uh, outcome other than death, number one. And if you use pH, a low pH, as a measure, as a predictor of subsequent handicap, it fails 95 out of 100 times. Where does this come from? Where, what, what, why are we so deceived? You may be aware of something called encephalopathy. This is a baby who has neurologic consequences presenting at the time of birth. And we have spent most of the research looking at the relationship between various measures of 
both outcome and care, depending upon the severity of the encephalopathy. How severe are the signs and symptoms of neurologic function in the newborn? And we have essentially said babies who have mild encephalopathy are of no consequence subsequently, and that we're going to focus on the babies with severe and moderate encephalopathy. Guess what? There's no difference in the risk of neurologic lesion between mild, moderate, and severe. You are looking for the wrong endpoint. It's not there. The pH is not there. Charles talked about using AI to measure, to help us with lots of things. There's a whole, there are many, many studies on AI in obstetrics trying to figure out how to turn all of this computing power into analyzing fetal heart rate pattern. You know what they're using it for? To predict the pH to predict a low pH, and it's going nowhere. It can't help you. So you're going to have to ask the right questions. AI doesn't work without a little guidance. And so if you insist that babies be very severe at the time they're born, or be very acidotic at the time they're born, that has very little to do with what obstetrics has done or what obstetrical care can do. <clears throat> Raise your hand if you know who Usain Bolt is. A little famous. You know he runs. <laughs> considered the world's greatest sprinter of all time. He's got all these characteristics, and there's a very famous article published by a European physics journal that says he can't run that fast. That's what it says, can't run that fast. And this is a picture, one of the most famous pictures, where he's looking at everybody behind him. <laughs> you guys coming? Uh, I... I can only wait so long. That for me is not Usain Bolt's greatest contribution or his contribution, I believe, to these services. It's what he did after the race. He's just set the world record for the 100 yard dash and you know what he does? He picks up a flag and the guy runs around. He has just run the world's fastest 100 yard dash and you would not have known it. You would not have known it. He's glad handing, glad handing anybody who will do it, flirting with pretty girls, <laughs> enjoying the whole stadium. What you may ask is the same ball got to do with what I'm talking about. Let's suppose we ask Usain Bolt to run the race again. Take a minute off and do it again. And after you do that, take a minute off and do it again. I submit that sooner or later, despite the extraordinary human being that he is, the races will become a little slower. And after a time, he may sit down after a race and breathe hard. This is the effect of running a race again and again. It's called labor. Contractions start when you have your first period. 
they are least in the middle of your periods. They are most when you have pain with your periods or when you have labor. Okay. Contractions with a fetus inside a uterus produces all of these effects. It limits the amount of oxygen. It increases the pressure in your environment. It increases the pressure in your head. It increases the fetal blood pressure. And it mag those effects are magnified when the mother is pushing. And in case you didn't know it, it causes pain to the mother. Is that not a hundred? Is that not worth a hundred meter dash? Which we have to do over and over and over again. And you see these relationships. You see the relationship of the pressure inside the head has to be greater than the pressure in the uterus, right? The head's not formed completely. It's not solid. It's not. <laughs> it folds, it bends, it responds to the pressure. You can't have the pressure inside the uterus be greater than the pressure inside the head. It's going to collapse, collapse on the brain. That means with every contraction, the pressure inside the head has to rise to meet the pressure in the uterus. That's great, unless you're obliged to supply the brain with blood flow during that time. That means you have to raise your blood pressure higher than the pressure in the head to be able to perfuse the brain. And guys, there's a limit. There's a limit to what the fetus can do. There's a limit to how often Hussein Bolt can run this. And what do we know from the time of the conception? We know sooner or later this pregnancy is going to need to end. You're going to have to have re-entry. And during that re-entry, you're going to be exposed to contractions which have all of these effects. And nature has supplied the fetus with robust defenses to protect against the limitation of oxygen, and to protect against the limitation of squeezing on your head robust reflexes, which are not insurmountable. I'm sorry, which are, don't last forever. They don't, they can't withstand all assaults. And what your job as an obstetrician is not to figure out how much of this we can tolerate, the baby can tolerate, okay? But take advantage of those defenses help those defenses and make for a better outcome by keeping the baby out of harm's way in the first place. Here are the two mechanisms. The majority of obstetrical textbooks do not recognize reflexes that protect the brain against pressure. These defenses which protect the brain against, the fetal brain against pressure are absolutely unique. They are fully formed at the time you are born, fully formed. Babies have something called a dive reflex. Anybody here a diver, trained diver? Trained divers, when, what's the dive reflex? You hit the water and your heart rate goes down and your blood pressure goes up. Charles, when you dive, does the bradycardia occur and the blood pressure occur before you dive, when your face hits the water, or at some arbitrary time after the dive? In <laughs> it occurs in anticipation of the dive. Why would you have a reflex that, that invokes itself some arbitrary time after you've hit the water? when you don't know how long you're gonna be in the water. 
these reflexes are fully formed at the time of birth. They can be trained, they can be invoked, and you know what? They disappear. You will never have as much tone, you will never be able to move your heart rate around again when you were an adult as you did when you were a term fetus. And the reason for that is you don't, for those of you who've developed hard skulls, you don't have to worry about somebody squeezing on it every couple of minutes. That reflex essentially modifies over time because you don't need it. It was put there for the specific reason of protecting you in the dive. And just as kids can be asphyxiated when those reflexes get, uh, get overwhelmed, so can the head compression reflex. And this is where you could have a role to play. Baby has all of these defense mechanisms, but as I've tried to say, they can be overwhelmed and you have to keep them from being overwhelmed and you have to understand that when the mother starts pushing, that simply exaggerates what is under the best of circumstances, a snug fit. We've talked about the fact that the bones are malleable, that push, that the pressure from pushing, the pressure from contractions is transmitted inside the skull. And there are these robust reflexes. How do we take advantage of those robust reflexes? Well, we come to understand that when Charles dives in the water, I can take advantage of that by the change in his heart rate pattern. So when he dives, I can see that. I can see the change in his heart rate pattern, and I'm going to use that information the information and the change of heart rate pattern, not as a means of detecting hypoxia, but a means of asking the fetus questions. The fetal monitor tracing, if you've ever seen it, is uh, looks like a bunch of wiggles and squiggles. To some of people with more experience, it's a language, imperfect to be sure, but one that is capable of ask, answering important questions, not what's your pH. Any physician in the room want to answer, tell me what, what condition is uh, uh, best understood by the first question, what's your pH? Not many. Let's ask some important questions. Are you behaving yourself? What's going on inside your head? Do you have a burning desire to meet a pediatrician? How did you like that contraction? Over and over again, I can query the fetus. How did you like that contraction? And understanding the response helps me understand not only fetal behavior, the, the vulnerability to ischemia, that is the impairment of blood flow from squeezing your head, or the impairment of your oxygen availability from too many contractions. You may not have much experience reading fetal monitor strips, but what I hope you can realize, this is two channels, the bottom is the uh, contraction channel, the top is the heart rate channel. It's not really heart rate, it's heart rhythm. The rate itself is not material. The rate across the whole top is the same. But even with limited experience, I hope you can see that there are three different epochs of heart rate pattern. One when the baby's snoring, one when the baby's uh, got REM sleep and one when the baby's actively moving. It has nothing to do with heart rate. It has nothing to do. And I didn't even tell you what the rate was. 
the interpretation of that tracing would not matter whether the heart rate was 30 beats per minute higher or 30 beats per minute lower. That pattern is what tells you what's normal. And there is no greater way to tell not only normal behavior, but almost certainly the absence of certainly neurologic injury. This is a different baby. This is a baby who is not asphyxiated, but you can so see the difference. This totally monotonous heart rate pattern that has no variation whatsoever. No variation whatsoever. The reason we take it, can take advantage of it is as simply demonstrated by what happens if I were to shake hands with you. If we shook hands, your heart rate would go up. Your blood pressure would go up. My heart rate would go up. My blood pressure would go up. It's been called the penalties of a handshake. It says, I'm responsive to what's being offered. It's not an intrinsic property of my heart that I'm watching. It is the responsiveness of the brain controlling the heart. And that's what I need to take advantage of. And you take advantage of because the format, the shape, and the timing of the slowings of the heart rate when he's when Usain Bolt slows down, this timing and the shape of it will tell you where the problem of blood flow is. The problem of blood flow is either outside the uterus, when the uterus contracts, it limits the blood flow into the uterus, or if you interfere with the gut the umbilical cord, or if you interfere with the cranial blood flow, all of those have different patterns. And you put that together with the response of the heart rate. So that's the heavy breathing. When he slows down, that's a deceleration. And when you breathe heavy, you, after the deceleration is over, you see the heavy breathing. And the response to the deceleration is what tells you how he liked or she liked the, the contraction. And that's where you look for the answer, not in the deceleration. That only tells you the mechanism, but you're looking to the response. How long did it take you to come back to normal? In obstetrical care, we created three categories because that's defensive. Three categories called category one, category two, category three. Category one is normal, category three is terrible, category two is not category one or three. <laughs> you think I'm kidding. You, you think that I made this up. That's the definition of is it clear that there have to be four categories? Do you have normal heart rate with variability or do you not? Do you have decelerations or do you not? Normal heart rate, no decelerations, normal. No heart rate, no, uh, no decelerations, poor variability, there's something wrong. Something wrong with your behavior. It's something wrong with the neurologic control of your heart rate. There is no way to have a category with three to categories, categorize fetal heart rate patterns in a three system. So the specialty would say you don't have to intervene till category three. Everybody will agree, whatever you know about fetal monitoring, that when the heart rate has gone, whoops, when the heart rate has gone from 140 and it's now 60 and the place is a madhouse because we're trying to get this baby delivered, you understand that maybe you've lost an opportunity to do this better. And you've understood that maybe the need for a crash emergency cesarean section is not a measure of good obstetrics, no matter how, wet, how quickly you get it.
Unlike the human, the majority of experimental animals have smaller brains and skulls, less prominent faces, and do not ordinarily undergo the mechanical rigors of human birth. There is no experimental animal that will tell you about the consequences of head compression in human birth. There is no animal. This is the relationship of the pelvis to the head in various species. And on the right is the relationship of the human to the pelvis. It's a snug fit, <laughs> which is why in the lower graph, you see why it takes so long sometimes. While there may be no great urgency to save a few minutes, nor is there great reason to extend this process indefinitely as we have begun to do. Because thanks to the development of MRI, which have been taken during labor, we are able to see that this is not a structure that stays, the fetal head is not a structure that is unmoved, unmoved or unmolded by the process that this is a very dynamic process and it is not, not like basketballs or automobile tires to which it has been, um, to which it has been uh, compared rather absurdly, I must say. To understand the normal consequences of normal labor with normal outcomes, you need to understand that there's a certain amount of deformity of the head, that there's a redistribution of the fluid with inside the head, so that there are very there's less fluid in the central part of the brain in all babies who are delivered vaginally. There can be skull fractures, there can be a lot of misshaping, there can be all kinds of we see all kinds of mechanical things, most of which we get away with, some of which we don't. But they are a reflection of the extraordinary pressures and the uh, complicated nature of progress through the birth canal. Okay. Too many contractions, too much molding, too much, too much molding malposition of the fetal head, all of these are correlated with adverse neurologic outcome. Just the size of the head correlated with adverse outcomes. That is why it is so important to get rid of the stereotype of in the movies of the second stage of labor, push, 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 push. Don't bear down, take a little longer, push with every other contraction. Because as the length of the second stage, as the length of pushing increases, all of these bad things increase. Risk of harm to the mother, risk of harm to the baby, the need for intervention, all of those things change as the amount of pushing goes. And how does that work? How does that work? If you put too much pressure on the head and the baby can no longer respond by raising its blood pressure, you now have shut off the blood supply to the brain and cause stroke or neurologic injury. It is, an understo it is understood that the risk of stroke to the fetus will never be the same, it will not be equal in the next 50 years. The risk of stroke in a newborn around the time of birth will not be exceeded for 50 more years. Now, well, welcome to junk science. <laughs> Head compression doesn't exist. You don't need defenses for the head. The fetal head is like a tire or a basketball. Some agree that there are these reflexes, but doesn't harm very much and doesn't have much to do. So if you're in a room 
with a patient who's delivering. Take a peek at the monitor. The baby will tell you when it's all right to push. And if you pushed with every other contraction, that would be all right too. Conflicts of interest and biases exist in virtually every field of medicine, particularly those that rely heavily on drugs or devices. It is simply no longer possible to believe much of the clinical research that is published or to rely on the judgment of trusted physicians or authoritative medical guidelines. I take no pleasure in this conclusion, which I reach slowly and reluctantly over my two decades as an editor of the New England Journal. Marsha Angel. Marsha Angel. With apologies from inability to let well alone, from too much zeal for new and contempt for what is old, for demanding immunity, before accountability for hating malpractice more than bad outcomes, the line I got from Richard. From putting knowledge before wisdom, science before art, and cleverness before common sense, from treating patients as cases, from making the cure of the disease more grievous than the endurance of the same. Good Lord, deliver us safely. I leave you with the picture of a horse. You may not be able to see the whole horse, but maybe you can uh, get some idea of the direction it's going. If they can get you asking the wrong questions, they don't have to worry about the answers. And that's what's so important about the literature. Are they asking the right questions? Are they answering them appropriately? I leave you with Agatha Christie. How much do we know at any time? Much more or so, I believe, than we know we know. Thank you very much. A couple of questions to, to bring this around to what we know about uh, junk science and what we have to do as advocates, which is I think what we're concerned about here, obstetrics is a great example of where there's a lot of junk science, but we have to think about junk science in, in every field of medicine because it exists everywhere. Two things, number one is uh, using obstetrics as an example. <clears throat> you talked about, everybody's agreed that a normal fetal heart tracing is a well oxygenated baby and that a fetal heart tracing that deviates from normal in the United States called category two or category three, but in Canada, called either atypical or abnormal, but the same categories as in the US. There's this notion of inter-observer and intra-observer variability. So inter-observer is two doctors separately look at the tracing and come to a different understanding about what the tracing is. And intra-observer is the same person looks at the tracing twice separated by a period of time and interprets the tracing differently. But we as lawyers, I think, need to understand how deficient those those studies are it's the design that we need to look at those studies the designs are so defective they take a one hour piece of tracing in the absence of any other clinical information about what happened before or after and say well because two people differ in their interpretation therefore the tracing is of no value so that one thing is is the design of these studies and how we as lawyers owe it to our clients to look critically at these studies the second thing is um is things like epidemiology and the use of epidemiology, which I think we see often in our cases, and how epidemiology really can have no reasonable application to the specifics of any one case. So how should we as lawyers look critically at study design and, and the misuse of epidemiology? Uh, that would seem to be a lecture in its own reality. Um, we, I have a lawyer friend that I've worked for for a number of years, and um, every couple of years I get a, he shows me a case, and he said, this looks familiar. Yeah, it is. Uh, you saw it four years ago. This is our check. Uh, and every couple of years I would get the same tracing to read 
blind, not knowing I had read it uh, previously to see whether uh, I can come up with it. Um, you, you have to pay attention to the question that's being asked. What, what is the question in the study uh, being asked? I, I mentioned before about um, all of the AI efforts to correlate, to be able to use AI on uh, big data, lots of heart rate patterns to determine who's got a low pH. And the question is why, one, why would you do that? Because pH simply does not correlate uh, with uh, the outcome. And, and I have to tell you, these studies are uh, commonplace. Uh, I'm a reviewer for uh, several journals and um, the material that comes uh, about fetal monitoring and the material that comes on my desk is that they, most people have lost sight of the of the um, of the uh, of the questions they're trying to answer. It's the the problem about big data is the reason for big data is to allow us to refine concepts. The, the data itself is that's what it's there for to give us some principles, some guiding uh, notions of care, some guiding notions of uh, procedures that will protect uh, the individual fetus. We get away in obstetrics with a whole lot. And part of the reason we get away with it is we usually end our correlation with what's the APGAR score, did the baby go to the NICU, did the baby uh, have a problem? There is a um, bona fide neurologic diagnosis called presumed perinatal stroke, a stroke that has occurred at the time of labor and delivery, which I can assure you if it happens during labor, you will see it on the tracing. Presumed perinatal stroke is a baby who at two, three, four, five, or six months has seizures or weakness on the right side or the left side. Okay. It happened during labor. We did a study of severely handicapped babies with the use of vacuums and out of almost 200 babies, 10 of them went home. These are babies who are going to have CP, who have neurologic injury on the fetal heart rate pattern, who go home on the second or third day from the nursery, having passed what passed casual surveillance. They are not severely asphyxiated. They are not severely uh, encephalopathic at the time of birth. You cannot stop the correlation with what happens in the delivery room. One of the features I didn't talk about, that I did not talk about, uh, or I, I mentioned that what I was in terms of time, the risk of subdural hemorrhage in a normally a vaginally delivered term newborn is about 50%. 50% of term newborns have subdural hemorrhages. That does not exist if you get born by elective cesarean section. 50, almost 30 or 40% have retinal hemorrhages. Normal, these are normal babies. The overwhelming majority of these lesions, these problems disappear and are of no apparent consequences. Some of them stay and may be cavernitis for what later becomes known as AHT. 
if there's a failure of epidemiology, it's the, uh, it's the failure of the consequences of what we do and the lack of understanding of how much we can do and how, how important is obstetrical care. 